great level, whether it was 10 and unders, 12 and unders, got to coach in the 04 games in Athens, uh, as an assistant coach with Team USA, now as coach, a long time collegiate coach. So, I mean, at every level possible, he's been there. And I was just telling uh, these guys this story. Uh, one of the times where I really got to go know Coach Layson well was when he took over the Rose Bowl Aquatics Club uh, in Southern California. <clears throat> and we were, both, we were both living and working there at the same time in the same area. But Coach Udovic, Dan said this earlier to you guys about fighting for your working hours, right? Like fighting for working hours. I thought one of the biggest accomplishments that Coach Layson did when he was there was increase the practice time for that club. Right? I could talk about the things they won and things, but that didn't matter. But they developed a lot of players. There's a swing. If you look back in kind of the NCAA rosters of people who came from the Rose Bowl Club during this kind of generation, when Coach Layson was occupying the club, it was because he upped the amount of hours they were working, right? And they were working out in the morning, and he added strength and conditioning, and added different things uh, to their high performance model while he was there, and that was a huge accomplishment. And uh, uh, we'll talk a little bit about you know implementing drills and doing these things, but understand that we're all fighting the same fight. It's not a Midwest fight or a Southeast fight or a Northeast, or we're all literally fighting the same fight. The Rose Bowl Aquatics Club is a great center, but it sits under the Rose Bowl Stadium that you see every New Year's on TV, right, in the Rose Bowl game, right? So that pool sits in that parking lot. There's a lot of people who use that pool and want access to that pool. It's owned by the stadium. So uh, just one of, one of the uh, more relevant accomplishments we're talking about in terms of what we're working with here. But uh, currently the head coach at UC Davis. Thank you, Coach Lacey, for being here, and uh, let's get going. Thanks a lot. I can't, I can't tell you how excited I am to be here and see so many coaches in the room. It's really great. And, um, you know, I have ties to the Midwest, and, and uh, my mom lived in Western Springs for a little while when she was younger. And uh, I've always been impressed, honestly, with the Midwest players that have come out to California and done really well. I mean, I played with Matt Went in the back there back in the late 80s. And uh, I coached Chris Went at UCLA and, and Matt Farmer. And uh, even more recently, Shane Hughes at Santa Clara. So the players that have come out from the Midwest, the work ethic and the drive and the, um, the ability to grind, it's been really impressive. So I, I'm, I'm happy to be here and, and, and to try to help in any way that I can. So today we're going to talk about creating and implementing effective drills. And so I want to ask you guys, have you ever had a, who says ever, have you ever had a good idea for a drill um, like this or something that I got from Water Polo Planet? And uh, when you when you tried it out, it made you feel like this. Dave Reed, an excellent free throw shooter, will have the honors to the Well, I have. If you have, and I have. So, uh, so okay, let's let's talk about some some reasons that the, the best uh, the best laid plans, you know, don't work as well as we might think. Do you have any ideas why drills don't maybe don't work as well as we thought they would when we wrote them up in our in our uh, room before practice. Any ideas? Go ahead, in the back. Bad explanations? Bad explanations, absolutely. They're too complex? Too complex, perfect. It looked great in my head, but I'm working with teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. More ideas? Bad demonstration. Bad demonstration? Yeah, thanks, OK. Um, so yeah, I wrote, those are all absolutely true. I wrote down poor planning. And when I say failure, it doesn't necessarily mean that the drill falls completely flat, you know, but it just means that it doesn't go as well as we thought or, or something occurs during the drill that we didn't anticipate and that's kind of what, or it, it does fall flat. That would be uh, just a bad drill, right, a bad plan. Uh, I wrote lack of understanding of the fundamental skills involved and that could be on the coach's part or it could be the player's. Um, and maybe there's not a logical progression in, in how you teach the drill. So we are going to talk about a progression in teaching drills and, and, and these details that were, are, are listed up here in the coming slides. So we're going to talk about the whole part, whole teaching method when it comes to teaching a drill. And we're going to have a drill demonstration to go through the parts. Are you guys familiar with the whole part, whole method? Mm -hmm. Yes, no, some people know. Okay, well, here we go. So here's, here's the uh, whole part, whole. The way it works is you start by showing the end product. And we'll get into more detail about the steps uh, as we go along. But it starts with the end product. So you're going to show your players a demonstration, whether it could be video, it could be a dry land walkthrough. And like I said, we'll, we'll get into the more nuts and bolts of that. It could be, and I hate to say this, a drawing on the whiteboard. <laughs> OK. Uh, so you go for the whole, and you break the, dr the drill down into its parts. OK? And then <coughs> gradually reconstruct the drill. 
and then you attempt the end product. And that's the whole part whole. Uh, this is the whole part of the whole part whole teaching method. All right, and so the drill that we're going to use as our demonstration is called the stagger start counterattack drill. Okay, and this drill, uh, copyright Adam Wright at UCLA or whomever he learned it from, and I worked it for him as an assistant coach, so I paid all the royalties for this drill in blood, sweat, and tears. <laughs> I promise you that. Um, and this drill is great, and it ties in with what Drew was saying about how everything needs to flow together because it focuses on the end of the counterattack and the beginning of the front court offense. This little piece that is so valuable if you want to have a flow from counterattack into front court. If you don't want to just think of the counterattack as one entity and the front court as a separate entity, you'd like to have flow between the two. You'd like to keep the pressure on the opponent through this phase. And I'd like to ask that if anybody is not understanding what I'm saying, if I'm speaking too quickly or it's too complicated, please stop me and let me know. If, if you think that it's too complicated, for sure there's another person out there that does, so don't be afraid, okay? So um, here are the step-by-step -step pieces of the drill. Okay, you try to imagine this. We'll have a video of this drill in a second. The way it works is you're going to start your first line of offense the first line of the counterattack on five meters. And I'm going to share these slides with you also, so if you don't feel like you have to write everything down. Okay? The first line of the offense starts on roughly five meters. The second line of the counterattack starts on about 11 meters. Okay? Somewhere in there. Just not on the two meter line. So you have to move in. Okay? In our example that we're about to show, the ball is brought down the right side of the pool. The first line will arrive to two meters on the whistle, we blow the whistle, and the first line arrives to two meters, and the second line is going to fill in our six on five counterattack structure. Okay, and in the example we're going to show, this is a little bit, a lot of words here, but our center is facing the one two side. So the ball is brought down the right side of the pool, which is the four five side. The center is facing the one two side. So Drew mentioned a lot about transferring the ball from one side of the pool to the other. In our example here, we're going to have to transfer the ball under pressure from the 4-5 to the 1-2 side, specifically to position 2, who, using layout passing. And position 2 is going to make a layout entry pass to the center. And the center is going to shoot the ball. And the defense is quote unquote dummy defense, like 60%, just for purposes of the explanation and for the drill. Okay, and I, I specifically said layout passes around the perimeter and then layout entry pass so remember that and I'll explain what I'm talking about later. Okay, and then players are going to take strokes back on defense. All right, so let's take a look at this drill. Six on six, dummy defense, all right? Here's what it looks like. skills that go into this drill in a second, but I want you to notice a couple things. First is the way that this player is swimming with the ball down the right side of the pool. We train our players when they're coming down the right side of the pool to look left. All right. And Dayan mentioned uh, this whole thing about swimming. And if you're, if you're <clears throat> paying attention to your swimmers when they're swimming head up, a lot of times what ends up happening, if I'm trained to breathe to the right when I'm swimming head down, then when I swim head up, I go like this also, and I move to the right. Have you, ever, have you guys ever noticed that? Okay, and that's not proper head up swimming. Head up swimming is your head is going each direction, right? So um, we have to work on this particular skill if, our, if we're not trained properly to do it. So as we swim down the right, we look to the left, and we look hard to the left, because a lot of times, especially in a second line counterattack, a four on three, a five on four, or a six on five, the open player is behind us, okay? So I have to look not only to my left, but also behind, okay? So we're coming down, I want you to notice position two. This player here is going to enter into the post to create a four-two balance, okay? That is our six on five counterattack structure. We like to end it in a four-two, that's pretty classic six on five counterattack advantage, okay? But then we're not going for a shot, so he needs to balance out. 
and we teach our players how we want them to balance out. We want them to swim backstroke when they balance out for the basic reason that they need to be watching the play. Sometimes he might be left wide open right there. If he's swimming freestyle, he cannot receive the ball and shoot. Also, sometimes he might be able to receive the ball and pass to the center uh, on a live entry pass. Okay, so we like to have him swim backstroke. Okay, players are going to move the ball around the outside with layout passes, so there's another skill. And then the layout entry pass is a specific pass. Okay, and we, we train our players to make a layout pass to the center under pressure by elevating out of the water before they throw it in. Okay, because why do we want, let me ask you this, why do we want our position two player to elevate when he's under pressure to elevate before he throws the ball to the center? Why? Any ideas? To capture the goalie's attention? Exactly. Okay, so if I'm under pressure, that means that the goalie might have an opportunity to come out. So if I'm on my back like this and I just throw the ball into the center, the goalkeeper is reading me if he's smart and he can come out and steal the ball. But if I get up on my legs and I look at him, then I pin him back in the goal and I can throw the ball to the center. It's not just the goalkeeper though, it could be position X3, it could be X4. If they're playing more realistic defense, a lot of times they'd come back in that situation, right? So that's why we call it something specific. All right, that's a specific skill. Okay, so let's watch it one more time. Oh, training specific skills that are required in that particular facet of the game. Okay, that's good. All right. Next, we can solidify our counterattack structure. Okay, so the stagger start drill can be run with any numerical superiority from one on nobody to six on five. Okay, for a one on nobody, I'm just starting seven meters, seven yards, going in. It's not a full court. One on nobody, two on one. Any numerical superiority, superiority, we can work on our structure, okay? And you, as coaches, should have numerical uh, uh, structure for every numerical superiority that there is on a counterattack, including short lead and long lead, one on nobody. So what do I do when I have a player right on my back and I have a one on nobody? What do I do when I have a longer lead? How do I attack a two on one? How does my team attack a three on two? This is something that you should be thinking about if you don't have it. Okay, and telling your players. They should know. We have too many players that are arriving to the Division I level that don't know basic counterattack structure. Unacceptable. There, that's mine. <laughs> I don't want to teach it. No. <laughs> we can fold it back into the, the drill. So we've isolated one facet of the game, and then we can fold it back into the greater context of the game, and that's really where the magic is supposed to happen, right? That we've improved this particular skill, and now we folded it back in, and we're better at that skill and we have a greater understanding of how it fits in in the context of the game. That's our job as coaches to make sure our players understand that. Okay, and then we can use any number of players that we want. Like I said, anywhere from one to six attackers, anywhere from one to six defenders. You don't have to have six defenders. You can pick one position and put a defender on one key position and have them work on preventing a live entry from uh, position two, for example. Uh, and then both goalkeepers can be included. So anywhere from one to 14. Cons. All right, tons of stoppage when you're learning this drill. Tons of stoppage. It's important to know the cons because as coaches, you should have a written plan for each one of your practices. And you should have how long you're gonna, you're gonna dedicate to that particular drill written on your sheet. Okay, I'm gonna do 20 minutes of stagger start today. Okay, but today we're learning the drill and so I need to know that it takes a long time to learn it and you have to stop a lot when you're doing it. So you need to know that. Setup takes time. Imagine you have the first line on five meters. You have the second line on 11 meters. You blow the whistle, you go. Now these guys are down here. You want to run it again? Everybody has to go back. You want to run it again? Everybody has to go back. So 
that takes time. That's going to factor into your practice plan. All right. One of the cons can be it's artificial. All right. We said that one of the pros is that it's artificial, right? That we've pulled this piece out. One of the cons can be that it's artificial. If we do not do a good job of helping our players understand how this piece fits into the greater picture. Does that make sense? Okay. And then it's challenging for large groups. All right. So if you have more than 14 players and you decide that you're going to stagger in on a counterattack and then go the other way if, however many times you want, if you have more than 14 guys, what are all those other players doing? Are they just sitting? I know that uh, as club coaches, you might have as many as, what, 28, 30 players at your practices? 40, 50. More? You, you're, is that more yeah. than that? 40. 73. 50. 73? Yep. In a, how, how many, how big is your pool? 10 lanes. Okay, so you got, you got to work some magic. It's absurd. You can do it. We can go, we'll go into it later. You can do it. You have to do it. All right. So let's go through some of the individual skills that are involved in this drill. I already, I already gave you a couple, right? Uh, swimming with the ball properly. All right. So these individual skills need to be trained. And I'm using this drill as an example. But if you have another drill that you want to do, you should know the individual skills that are involved in that drill. And you should train those skills. And you should make them part of your practice, part of your warm-up, part of your station training that Dayon suggested. Okay? One of them, swimming with the ball. Okay, here we go. Are we going to swim head down with the goggles? Nope. You're going to swim 25s of looking to the left only with the ball. High elbow, strong flutter kick. You're going to do that. You can get plenty tired doing that. You can, you can create tears doing that if you want. Okay? You can create the suffering with 25s head up. I believe in the suffering also. <laughs> uh, 25s looking only to the left. 25s looking only to the right. Okay? If we're on the left side, we only look to the right. There's no reason to stare at the wall. You'll see your players do this, I promise you. They'll be going down the right side, and they're supposed to be going like this, and they'll be turning that way, because that's how they breathe when they're swimming head down. It's a thing. Okay, and also looking both directions, which I do when I'm swimming down the middle with the ball, right? Because otherwise I'm going to get smashed from one side or the other. Okay, so there's, there's one skill, swimming with the ball. Passing the ball at the end of the counter from the wing. Here's another skill, all right? So we have a technique at the end of the counter for how we want to handle the ball, okay? So let's say I'm swimming down. This is the right side of the pool over here, this line. The goal's over here. As I approach the cage, I'm looking to the left. Can you guys all picture this? Looking to the left. I want to take the ball. If I'm right-handed, I want to take it, I want to push on it, and I want to get inside two meters if I can. All right, so we're taking the ball not to two meters, inside two if we can, as deep as we can possibly go. If I, don't, if I can't do it because the guy jumps me, then I'll pass sooner, okay? But from this position, now to make a layout pass up here is a technique that I have to practice. I have to practice this skill as well. Going like that, inside the two, getting my body ready, and layout passing this way. So specifically from the end of the, at the end of the counter from the wing. Next, releasing for the ball. So maybe I can't just sit there and wait for the ball to arrive because the guy's playing hard defense on me. So I need to make a release move of some kind to get the ball. All right, important. And I can be doing that station training, warm up, conditioning. Layout passing under pressure. So now the ball's traveling around the perimeter. How well do you layout pass? Well, you could spend quite a bit of time on layout passing, right? And that's a lost art. And, and you see, and I see, and we all see players who cannot layout pass have to turn their back and draw a foul every single time. And then you get into that game that, where the refs, you know, he's like this, and he's like that. The refs decide, well, it's not a foul. What's a foul? It's not 10 seconds. The guy holding the ball can't pass it. Unacceptable. Learn how to lay out and pass the ball, okay? Balancing out at the end of the counter. So how do we balance? We said we swim backstroke along the two meter line and we say it for a reason. Here's why, okay? Center, holding position. So you can get into some center work. How does your center come down and spin and seal and hold position? Passing the ball to the center under pressure. So I described you our layout entry pass, right? So you could do that. Proper defensive counterattack swimming. How do we swim at, at, at when we're not beat in transition? Are we swimming freestyle? Are we swimming backstroke? Right? How do we attack a player from a backstroke position? So now I'm, I'm working backstroke swimming into my conditioning. So I'm, okay, we're going to do a lap, three strokes free, three strokes back, and at the end, I've got to jump over and attack someone. 
Okay, and I'm doing that. Instead of swimming with goggles. All right? <laughs> Proper defensive positioning at the end of the counterattack. We know, as coaches, we know that our players struggle with getting in good defensive position at the end of the counterattack. Do they take the extra stroke or do they get lazy and stay in bad defensive position? So you can work on taking the extra stroke. Also, very important, lunge blocking. Just described it. Another lost art. How do I guard a guy when he's laying out to pass the ball in proper lunge block position, right? Communication. So Drew talked a lot about communication. It's essential. All right, so look at the number of individual fundamental skills that are involved in this drill. Okay, and this isn't all of them, right? And so it's your job, if you're going to have a drill that you want to teach, to figure out what these skills are and make the practice progress in such a way that it's logical for your players, okay? So now we're going to get our team started on teaching this drill, the stagger start counterattack drill. If we can, we want to walk through the drill on land. So in a little pregame meeting, you can walk through the drill on land. Peter Catino, the coach at Cal, was the first coach who ever had me walk through something on land, a front court offense, which was really great, effective. Okay, uh, so walk through it on land, walk through it in the water, Draw it, show a video, something that shows the end product. One is better in this situation. Any one of these is better than none. Two is better than one. Three is better than two. Okay? When you go to the water, ask your players to go through it in slow motion. Okay? And you guys coaching young players, you know it's very hard to make them slow down and do something. Isn't it? Okay. Yeah. It was for me. Maybe it's not. Good. <laughs> Slow, deliberate practice is not usually the, uh, the uh, characteristic of young players. Um, so you'll struggle to get your players to slow down, all right, and, and go through it slowly at first, all right? Explain the fundamental skills. So, all right, team, we're going to work on these skills are involved in this drill, and we need to make sure that we're conscious of this, and et cetera, et cetera, like we just described. And then train those skills. I'm going to show you one example of one of our practices at the end here and how we worked in the fundamental skills that we were going to work on later in the practice during our conditioning. Okay, and then you start simple and you progress forward. Okay, any questions so far on this? Okay, so we are um, now beginning our teaching progression. Okay, and we're starting with four players. Yes. How long, how long do you like to spend when you walk through? Like one rep, two reps, 10? Like how long is that? That's a great question. How, so everybody in the room, I believe, is, is um, pressed for time in their practices, right? You probably have a two hour block if you're lucky, two days a week maybe or something like that. How much time are you gonna, <laughs> you're gonna, you have to decide how much. And you have to decide how quickly your players can pick stuff up and how much time you wanna dedicate to this. But I would also keep in mind, that it takes time to learn a complicated drill, okay? So if you're expecting that you're just gonna walk through it and you're gonna go out there and it's gonna be like that, that's not the case. I'm talking about six on six a month, okay? Especially if you don't have five days a week, three hours where you can devote 20 minutes every day to meet, you kinda have to decide how much you wanna do and, and experiment with it. And then, please, you know, if there's one thing I've learned as a parent is that even when I think my kids aren't learning, like I'm getting frustrated because they're not learning, the next day they come back and they do it slightly better. So they are picking stuff up, right? And you who are parents, you know this. So if we can avoid having the top of our head blow off, like in the first minute of the drill, that's probably good because your kids are <laughs> learning it. Okay, now after you've done it for a month, your head can blow off, right? If they, they're not doing it, you know, you, but not really, you know what I mean. Okay, so anyways. Four players, and we're simulating a six on five counterattack where the center is on the three post. He does not have ball side, and the ball needs to be transferred to the one two side. Okay, now in this, in this example, our player is at position three. Okay, and I'll show you. Start with fewer players if you need to. Keep it simple. Here's the demonstration with only four players and no defense. Five, okay. So, 
the, the pass from three, the entry pass from position three, like you can easily have this position three player be over here and be position two, right? You don't have to have three. You could have position two. The entry pass from position three makes me nervous, right? Because we don't like to throw entry passes to the center from position three. We like to throw them from two and four or from the wings if we can, if he's holding good strong side position, right? But in this case, we, we did it from position three. Now, next progression, let's add another player, okay? Here we go. So the interesting thing about this one to me is that I didn't notice this. I miss a lot. I notice things on video later. Look at this guy here, okay? Did he start even with the first line like he's supposed to? He didn't, right? He started down deeper. Then I, thought, I started to think to myself, well, that's, that's actually not a bad thing because now it's a simplified movement for him. He doesn't have to swim as far. So he's really just working on moving down and getting in position and preparing himself to make this release, this entry pass, right? So later, he can start further out. This isn't the end of the world that he started here. It turned out to be fine. Okay, now let's add another. Now we have six players. Now, in our 4-2 balance, at the end of a counterattack, we're going to need this player here to drive to the post. Now you're going to start to see the whole picture come together. Balance, up, and release. Could this be helpful? Absolutely. You see the spacing that we have? Okay, if you're just working on spacing alone, that's enough. Okay, and to do it without defense is great. This is the same one. So now, here's a wrinkle. So now we're going to get a little bit more complex, just as an example, okay? Now we have six attackers, okay, but we're working for a pass to our counter attacking center defender. Does that make sense to you? The, the guy coming off the center on the back line, he's going to be at roughly position four on a six on five. Okay? So now we're going to work for a pass to this player who can shoot. So now it's a shooting drill from the outside. We have a big lead coming off the other team's center, and we want to work for a shot. Okay? And you can do this drill over and over. Position six can throw the ball to five for a shot, to four for a shot, to the post, to the inside uh, two post, all the way across to one. Any, any place you want to work on shooting. You can do it. So here's an example of just a little bit of a wrinkle. Okay, and now the other thing that's important to note is that this guy is right-handed. Okay, he's not a lefty. So now you're going to see, if it doesn't go out of the picture, the technique that we use to pass. ask about that because uh, I, I'm so happy you asked honestly because I was looking at this and, and I'm going uh, these guys are gonna wonder because I'm gonna talk about effective pla practice planning <laughs> and this, this is not this is not this was like we need to film this you guys get out of the way I'll deal with you later you know uh, but, yeah. thank you for asking that uh, we have a technique for a right-handed player making this particular pass so there's a lot of detail that goes into this, all right? Again, if I'm a righty and I'm looking left and I want to pass the ball to Dayon over here, okay? I'm coming in, I'm going to glide inside the two meter line and I need to drop my legs. I need to get into the vertical position. I need to climb up. I want the goalkeeper to come over. So I'm going to get up out of the water and then I'm going to pass the ball. How I pass it matters because in this particular case, I will be passing the ball over defenders who are going to be doing what? Jumping the for the ball. So if I throw a low ball across the middle, a smart player is going to take it, right? So it's a pass that should go like this, over defenders, right to our attacker's hand, an assist pass, we call it, a setup pass, if we do it right. Another skill that can be trained. Okay. Can't see it. All right, now 
let's take a look at the original drill, the six on six drill that we saw at the beginning. And let's talk about some ways where we can make it more realistic or more difficult. And I'm going to ask for your ideas on this. Here is the original drill. Until the center got the ball. Okay. So if when two gets it, you, you said the layout, you want him to elevate, the goalie didn't honor that at all. Okay. Bury that shot away and have some repercussion for the goalie if he lets that go. Absolutely. So keep the goalie honest. If he's cheating out, you can you can stick it for sure. What else? Any other ideas? <coughs> go ahead. Make the two meter man use his left hand. Okay. So he wants to work on it. He's working on a specific move, whatever it may be, a left hand turn inside. Okay, perfect. What else? Go ahead. Apply, apply more press to the first pass. Okay, so play more realistic more realistic defense. Right? We're playing dummy defense right now, 60%. Play more realistic. Press. Press harder. Okay? First of all, if we had no defenders, we could add any number of defenders that we wanted. Okay? We can increase the lead out of the backcourt. So this is becoming more realistic. Now we're working for a shot rather than layout passes around and an entry pass to our center. Okay? We can de decrease the lead. Now we're working for ball side. Okay? Just examples. We can change the position of the ball. Does the ball always come down the right? What if it came down the left? What if it was in the middle? How would we react? How would we get to the right structure? Change the second line structure. So we lined it up in a way where the, the, the guy on the right was, uh, was ahead with the ball. And the guy on the left was driving the two meters to fill that 4-2 balance. You following me? So what if the guy in the middle was ahead? Change it, because not every counterattack is the same. Okay? Incorporate the goalie. Have the goalie out left the ball. Defense. Play more realistic. So are they going to press necessarily? I don't know. Maybe they're pressing. Maybe when the ball arrives to position two, you play more realistic. Now they come back into a zone, and you have to deal with something like that. That's more of a game type situation. So now we're trying to incorporate this drill in a progression into the, the real game. What happens if the, the, the center doesn't even come back? What if he just sits there? How do you attack that? What do you do? Does that ever happen? He's so tired he doesn't even come back. He, he sees at a certain point, it's not even worth it. He stays there. You shoot the ball quick, it's a one on nobody, right? Are you ready for that when that occurs? Okay, now. You can receive a six on five. So you could stagger in, receive a six on five, play it out. You could, you could stagger in, depending on what training phase you're in, you could have eight six on fives. Maybe it's a, a day you really, you really want to work on six on five. Okay, you can do whatever you want. Adding counterattacks the other way makes it even more realistic. So we stagger in, and then we're going to go three counters or something like that. Okay? As many as you want. Depends on your training phase. Do you want to build a lot of rest into your training or do you want to go more conditioning type training? Right? Maybe end of the season in your taper for championships, you only want to go one counter at a time and have some rest in between. Your decision. 
Call an exclusion and transition. How do you attack that? Are you ready? Do you know what to do when there's an exclusion and transition and you don't have a timeout? Something can be trained. Increase the competitiveness like day on set. So make everything competitive, okay? You choose. Make it, take it, okay? We're gonna go stagger in, counter to the other side. You score the counterattack goal at the other side, you get to stay on offense. If you don't, you switch. You guys don't make it, take it. Stop it, take it, we call it CP. It's just the opposite, right? As long as you keep stopping the opponent, you stay on defense. As soon as they score, you're out, right? So that gives incentive to the defense to play a little bit harder. Keep score. Make it a game situation. Maybe you're down by two with three minutes left. Make it competitive. Make it realistic. You guys following me? And that's just for this, this drill example. Look how many things we're able to do with just one drill. How many different ideas, okay? So really, use your imagination because the possibilities are endless. And it's really up to you to, to, to uh, think about ways that you want, how you want to play and then incorporate drills in a, in a logical progression into your practice. So when you're thinking about drills, you guys know who these guys are? Nobody knows who they are. Nobody? Raise one hand. OK, these are the Beastie Boys. OK? So <laughs> that just fell completely flat. That's awesome. <laughs> so when we, when we, I'm going to continue on marching forward with this. When we're, <laughs> when we're just signing drills, we should be like the Beastie Boys, OK? Not like the early Beastie Boys, the uh, rude, crude, obnoxious. The more enlightened Beastie Boys who are sampling from the classics, paying homage to those that came before them, and then adding their, their flair to it that made it something new and special and effective, hopefully. Okay, so my point is, most of the drills that we do at Davis, that I do currently, are sampled versions of drills that I either learned as a player or learned from my coaching experience, Then we've added our little bit of flair to it, and we've made it our own. And I urge you to do the same thing. When you're, yes? Do you always run a 30 second clock or scrimmage? Uh, no, no. If we are, for example, if we're only working on front court, we're gonna start the clock at 20 or something less, right? Because you usually get down there with, with, that, with 20 or less even, sometimes 17, 16. So we, we vary the length of the clock. And we always have clocks out at our practice. I hope that you do too. All right, when teaching drills, it's important to know the Ratko Rudich law of drill acquisition. So I worked for Ratko Rudich in 2004 in the Athlet, uh, Athens Olympic Games, and he taught me a lot. One of the things was this. So when you're first teaching a drill, Athletes learn the drill. They need time to learn it, okay? When they know the drill, now they're able to work hard at the drill. They can expend effort at it because they're comfortable with it. They know what they're supposed to be doing. Make sense? And then inevitably, if you do the drill long enough, your athletes are going to find ways to cheat the drill. And this is why you gotta, it's important to keep things fresh, keep it moving forward, and um, add a little bit of wrinkle here or there to it so that they, they, um, they have to stay focused. All right? Okay, what to do with limited space? Um, we're all space challenged, right? You guys all space challenged with your, with your pool and stuff? Okay, I, I ran the Rose Bowl Club for a long time, and so I, I, I understand. Although I was blessed with more pool space, uh, one of the best things that you can do is plan ahead. I, I, I said earlier that you should have a written plan for each of your practices. If you're not doing that, that's a great way to start. Plan ahead, think about what you're doing, think about how you can keep people moving all right, through the practice. One of the biggest mistakes that I see from young coaches is that too many people are sitting around, okay? You have a shooting drill where there's 14 people in line and the two people are shooting and the other 12 people are goofing around, okay? Divide the group up immediately. Make another station and then coach, coach, get ready. Have a cup of coffee before practice and get ready to sprint around to each station. Get ready to say the same thing over and over at each station. Get ready to put the work in, okay? Use individual fundamental skills in your conditioning and your warm-up. So we went through all the individual fundamental skills that are involved in that particular drill. Please use them in your warm-up or conditioning, okay? One of the things that we do at Davis that I, I got from another coach uh, is to have program warm-ups, right? So you can create a 20-minute program warm-up that your athletes know and you can say, hey, if we're doing program 
whatever you want to call it today, and they know it. And that incorporates fundamental skills that are going to be involved in what you're doing later. Or you can use them um, in stations. Okay? Divide the group up, divide and conquer, keep the stations smaller. Okay? And then use the individual fundamental skills that are required in the drills you're doing later as one of your stations. All right? And be inventive with how you use the space. So here's an example that I wrote up hypothetically, okay? I imagined a 25-yard pool, most of them are 25 yards, seven, six, seven, eight lanes, maybe less, right? So on this end of the pool, we're going to stagger start drill, okay? Maybe we have six players, maybe we have more, depends on if you have 70 players, I don't know. <laughs> How you do it? Okay, in the middle here, we're swimming this way. Okay, and we have players that are swimming head up with the ball, looking only left, looking only right, and then looking both directions with the ball. Okay, or they're working on the technique that we described on how to pick the ball up at the end of the counter. Okay, or maybe they're doing a small layout passing drill, or maybe they're backing up across the pool in this position with a defender on them, where they're just working on their layout passing. Okay, and at this end over here, okay, maybe you're doing a conditioning drill, a, 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 excuse me, a counterattack drill that is related to the stagger start. Maybe you're doing a leg station. Maybe you're doing stagger start at two cages, right? So you've divided up the pool and you got people moving and each station is 15 minutes and you just, you go from there. Okay? What if, like, you're even more space challenged? Okay? I urge you to be creative with how you do it. I thought to myself, what, what if we have more than six players here? So we have these three players. In the first line, we have these three players in the second line, and we have maybe six players still that we're sitting. What if we have stagger in, finish the counter, you three, get out, go swim to the side, do 10 deck pull-ups, do 10 lunges, and walk back to the back of the line. I mean, if you're really that space challenged, you can come up with a lot of ways to incorporate some conditioning, to keep people moving, and to not waste time, okay? then. The, the second line that finished on the first line, here come three players from the, from the waiting group, and you just keep going, and it just keeps flowing through players out. If you have space here to swim, or to do egg beater, or to do jumping, or to do some kind of a, a drill that's related to the, the skills involved in stagger start, that would be great, okay? So there's an idea. When you're thinking about your drills, they should progress within themselves, so we've shown the drill progression uh, you know, with the stagger start starting with four people and going five, six, right? But also, they should progress within the training as well. And this really requires smart planning on your part, okay? And I'm going to give you an example of one of our practices from spring quarter, all right? And some of it's cut off here, unfortunately, but I just want to show Dayon here that we, I had the same epiphany that he had. So I'm so happy to hear him say this. I was talking to our football coach one day. And it's important to talk to other coaches. So if you ever have a chance to talk to other coaches about stuff, please do it. And he's, and, and I was trying to ask him about some Alabama football video where they were running sprints and, and it was, uh, he, and he goes, you know, we don't do that. We don't do that. I go, why don't you do it? He goes, well, we don't run like that in the game. So why do we condition, why, why would we do that? I was like, huh, that makes perfect sense. We are trained to swim with our head down, with goggles on. We're trained. I'm, Swimming is important, but we're trained when we get tired to put our head down. That's the worst thing you can do as a water polo player, right? And so all these swimming sets that we're doing, and swimming is really important, but all these sets that we're doing when we're exhausted, our head is down. That's not how we want to swim in the game. Why would we swim like that in the swimming portion? Uh, 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 why would in the swimming portion of water polo we want to swim one way, and in the conditioning portion swim another? That didn't make sense to me. So what we did is we decided that we weren't going to swim like that anymore. Any of the swimming that we were going to do within reason was going to be water polo type swimming. So you can see there's 200 here on the three minutes. Okay, this is a ten, this is 10 times 25 on 30 seconds. Half push, three four stroke setup, two three on your back on 45 seconds. The other thing is, you know, I'm not trying to offend any swimmers in the room. Honestly, we never flip turn in the game ever. <laughs> so we don't need to flip turn. Right? Part of the ability that, that your, t your players can make these sets, which is great, is that they can streamline and flip turn and do all the stuff that really good swimmers do. We don't do that. So hand push. I start with my feet, my hand on the wall. My feet like this. My legs are up. I push off, egg beater, rest it, and I start swimming. 
So now I'm working on my over the hip movement during our conditioning. And if you do it, you've done hundreds, thousands of, hip, of over the hip movements as a part of your conditioning. And so our focus here, you can see, was counterattack defense and front court defense. So hand push over the hip, two or three strokes on my stomach. I'm trying to get in front of the guy I'm guarding. And then I'm going to turn on my back. One, two, three. Oh, he's starting to catch me and pass me. I've got to turn back on my stomach. I'm going to turn on my back. Front, back, front, back, front, back. Okay? <coughs> head up, hand push. Head up, max. So this is conditioning portion. These are sprints. Okay? And then here, deep water start. So I'm off the wall when I start. I take off 10 strokes maximum. So my player is trying to beat me. And I need to take 10 strokes to not get beat. Max, to try to get in front of him. Okay? Then, turn on my back the rest of the lap and finish with a lunge block. There we go. So we've incorporated a bunch of skills that we're going to use in the game during our conditioning. And if you have limited time, you got to do something like this. It's plenty taxing, let me tell you. It's hard, okay? Then, at the bottom you can see it's not all um, exactly related. This is a conditioning portion. We were in a conditioning phase of our training, so we were doing some swimming with med ball, okay? The next phase of the practice was Trent, our assistant coach, individual skills work with our center and center defender in relation to the counterattack and front court defense. So we're, we were working on taking an extra stroke on defense and then guarding a drive. Our centers struggle with this. Most big guys do. They get to the end of the counter, they want to go, oh, now they got to guard a drive, right? So we were working on that skill. The, the field players were working on passing in groups of three, moving up and down the pool with two defenders in front. So we were swimming with the ball, and this guy was stunting in between. So I had to pass, stunting, working on swimming backstroke, stunting, swimming backstroke, stunting, as part of our progression. Okay, and then at the end, we moved into some uh, counterattack drills. All right, starting from seven, from, from half, uh, with a defender on your back. Then we went a full court two on one with a front court. Uh, with the defense out in front, focusing on stunting, getting on your back and playing in between. All right, then we went three on twos with the defenders shifting, okay, and, and so on. And we progressed. You can see the progression of our practice from the beginning to the end, okay? And the drill also progressed in difficulty. So everything is working in synergy, and your practices are going to be much more effective, especially if you've got limited time and limited space. The last thing I want to say is that. Um, Dayon mentioned more working hours. When I took over at Rose Bowl, we didn't train that much. And I had to fight for more pool time. One of the things that we did at the 14 and under age group was we decided to implement Friday night practices. Oh, you can imagine. Friday night, how could we possibly train on Friday nights? How? I was younger then, you know, didn't have kids and stuff, so I understand not everybody wants to do that. But by the end, our Friday practices were the most well-attended 14 and under practices. The parents love dropping their kids off. They go have a cocktail or whatever they do. They come back or they go walk around the Rose Bowl. Can't do that in February here, but, uh, you know, they can go do something. They were the most well-attended. So, like he said, just because you have an idea and no one else thinks it's good doesn't mean that you should stop. Okay? Go. Within reason. All right. So, any questions? Yes. You, uh, you were filming the practice earlier. How often do you film practice? How often do the kids watch it? Do you guys watch it? Like, what does that process look like for you? Great question. Thank you. Also, talking to my football, my favorite football coach at UC Davis, he told me he was astounded that a player, a, 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 a fellow coach at another university that he worked at was shocked that, they had, that the football team films their practice and they actually watch the film. And the coach, the other coach was like, how do you, you guys film the practice? Do you watch it? Yeah, yeah, we watch it. And then I decided, yeah, well, if these guys, if these football coaches are filming their practices, why can't we film our practices? And we should do that, okay? And we started doing it just this last season. I've been coaching for a long time. Just this last season, we started filming our practices. I would watch it. I took the time to watch it. We would watch a piece of it to begin the practice the next day and then reflect on it and move on to the next skill. And I could tell you, like, almost more important than filming the games, almost. The, the value of filming your practices, and you don't have to have somebody up there moving the camera, just set it up wide angle and just let it run. And then take the time to, to, to look at it. It's uh, one of the best teaching tools there is. So great question. Do the athletes watch? Yeah, yeah. I watch it, make notes on it, and then we watch it together the next day. Absolutely. In season, it becomes more difficult. 
But yes. Yes. How much are you willing to let your athletes struggle and not get it or step in and fix it? Like how much? Yeah. That's I think that depends on your personality. I tend to be I tend to be one of those guys that wants to try to step in and help, you know, and I feel like I need to like not do that as much and let people kind of work through it on their own. So I'm trying to find that balance. I don't I don't have a concrete answer for you. I think it depends on your personality. Going over that tomorrow in the like planning session. Yes. So if you mentioned that athletes will start to cheat drills yeah. as they as they do them for too long. So we've noticed like for our team that pressure passing drills are very often cheated. So do you have any suggestions for either stopping that or for creating new pressure passing drills? Um, I think that the, the best way to stop the cheating is to somehow make it competitive. Like to somehow make some kind of a game where there's punishment. Um, you know, like if you're able to make three nice layout passes in a row, your defender has to do, I don't know, 10 jumps or something like that. Um, and then just thinking about ways that you could change the drill up a little bit instead of just doing the same old drill over and over. One of the coolest drills I saw was this guy, Giannis, Giannis Generis. Have you seen him on Facebook? He's, he, he, Giannis what? Yeah, I noticed, yeah. He, he posts videos of drills on Facebook. One of, one of the drills that he had was, if you can imagine this, um, two, two attacking players and then two attacking players. Well, one's a defender, one's an attacker. And they're, they're going back and forth like this. So if you can imagine, I got a partner here with a ball, and I got a partner here. I got a guy on my back. Okay, so I start to swim like this, and I receive the ball. And I need to pass it to this player here. Now, this guy takes off, right? And so he's going that way. Now I have to go chase him. So I'm chasing him. He receives the ball. He lays out and pass. Now I take off, and I go. And we're just going back and forth in the middle, layout passing. Very hard. Very difficult. And then you can choose which side the ball is coming from. You can choose how much pressure you want. Uh, you can choose the interval. So that's, that's you can make it a shooting drill if you want. That, that, there you would be like the Beastie Boys, right? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Um, what did you find was most valuable from the practice developments for you? Do you notice a lot of things you missed five times with your players? Or what value do you get from that? It's such a good question. I, I, think, I think my opinion is that um, the, having the players see how they practice is eye-opening to them. Maybe they're not aware of just how, how, they, how they train. I think that's it in a nutshell. I, I mean, it's, you know, everybody thinks the game's different in practice. You try to tell them it's not, and then, hey, here's how you train, and here's the same mistakes happening in the game, or here are the same good plays, and I think, I think that might be it. Yeah? I think when Hopefully, yes. Yeah, I think I think I let's thank Coach for the question. We're gonna make we're gonna